Hello everyone, how are you doing? This is Pranalier, also known as Late Riser 12, and this is my team selection video for Game Week 3. Uh, we're going to be talking about how I did in Game Week 3. We're going to be talking about Nkuku, who I need to replace, who I have replaced, and options. I, we're going to be talking about captaincy this week, which we didn't cover on the pod. We're going to be talking about wildcarders and what they should be doing. Should they be wildcarding this week? Should, be the wild, should they be wildcarding later? And if they're wildcarding later, certain tips that they should keep in mind. And yeah, we'll go through things as they work out and uh, it should make for an interesting video. Right, first up, uh, also if you guys haven't already seen, uh, Russ and Zoff both have done their team selection videos as well. They've covered a lot of other information outside of their own teams as well. So those videos are very useful. I'm hoping this one is going to be useful too. So make sure you check it out. And I thought the pod we did on Tuesday was an absolute banger. If you haven't uh, seen it already, I recommend you catch it because I thought that was just one of our best pods in my opinion. All right, so how did we do this week? Not the best but not terrible either. I mean, we had Haaland who was captain. That's half the job done. Uh, I had Saka who got an assist. I got Jota who got six points. Underwhelming because Jota should have honestly been on two or three goals and a couple of more assists. Uh, incredible block from a Trent cross. Trent got six points. Trent should have... Trent owners have been getting away with it. Trent non-owners have been getting away with it. Trent should be on an attacking return or two minimum, in my opinion. He's looked so good and liverpool look like they're going to be a better defensive unit just because of the control that they're going to have this season it's not as rock and roll as it used to be under club so if you don't have trent already i recommend getting him in especially in game week four when the fixtures turn and they've got two home fixtures good home fixtures back to back henderson and munoz got a one pointer each which is a bit unfortunate uh i mean palace control the game until the 70th minute and then for some reason glasner decided to sub off Lerma and Gordon Kamada and said he was a bit lightweight in midfield. He was much better in the front three uh, uh, at, in the midweek Carabao Cup tie, which was good for Palace, which was good for Kamada, which was good for Munoz as well. Because Munoz wasn't good with Eduard. And it's different when Munoz is playing with an Olise who tends to occupy two or three defenders versus Munoz playing with an Eduard who was just bad. I'm hoping either Saar or Kamara play in the front three, which should be better for Chelsea, hopefully. Uh, Robinson got a 7-pointer through his assist. They should have kept a clean sheet, considered a sloppy set-piece score, but Robinson's look really, really attacking. No problems with him. Gordon got 10 points and Isaac got 2 points. A lot of people are showing impatience with regards to Newcastle, but they changed the game. Uh, Eddie Howe's team selection at the beginning was terrible, playing Kelly, playing Longstaff, playing Murphy. When he brought in all his ball players, Trippier, uh, Barnes, and... Uh, Hall in the second half. Newcastle in the final third of the game were much, much better. They dominated the game, created a fair few chances. And I like what I saw in the last 30 minutes from that Newcastle game. I hope that uh, that is how that selection is continued into the game, home game against Spurs, where they beat Spurs last year. Now, Spurs have started real, but I have a feeling Newcastle will get more than two goals in this game. So I'm not too pessimistic about that situation. Muniz had six or seven shots, but got only two points, not much show for it. Sangare was pretty decent on set pieces, and he's a good 4.5 million option. For wildcarders, if you're looking for a 4.5 million midfielder, Sangare is probably the best pick, in my opinion, out of all the 4.5 million midfielders. All right. Before we get into planning, etc., I just wanted to talk about Sleeper now. I'm talking about Sleeper and speaking about them from a draft perspective, especially because I feel like the transfer window shuts tonight. And that means that this international break, after the weekend's football is done, is probably the best time to have a draft uh, with your friends. And Sleeper is one of the best platforms to have that draft. We're doing one, in fact, amongst content creators on Monday, which I'm really looking forward to as well. You can customize things. You can customize the time limit required. Uh, to make a pick you can play a long draft with like a five hour six hour pick time and just it helps pass the two weeks as well like instead of like doing like a quick draft as well so yeah man sleeper is one of the best platforms out there and i recommend uh, you get into the draft game and it gives us something to do during the international break we're playing a couple of drafts with our discorders as well uh, so this should be fun and uh, make sure you're uh, liking and subscribing this video all right now transfer targets for me i Currently, uh, I'm looking at wildcarding in game week six, not immediate wildcard, but I'm making the practice of considering the wildcard every week. That said, I had Nkuku who's a problem and I need to get rid of him. So who are my transfer targets? 
who were my transfer targets rather. Ipswich is up there with Fulham at home, Brighton and Southampton, but I don't quite fancy any of the midfielders. Aston Villa is really up there. Leicester away, Everton at home and Wolves at home. So whether you're considering Ollie Watkins, whether you're considering Rogers or Leon Bailey or Aston Villa defender, these fixtures are outstanding. Like you can't, and and then in game week six they've got Ipswich, Ipswich away also if I'm not mistaken. So if you're on wildcard, Watkins needs to be in there. Consider Rogers. Like I would look to jump on Aston Villa assets because these fixtures are great. Everton have problems in defense. The players are still not fit. Uh, Wolves we know look poor defensively. Mosquera they're missing Kilman and Leicester also haven't looked great. So great on our fixtures. So Rogers uh, obviously was in my thoughts. Uh, Southampton didn't look that great. They conceded uh, six big chances to Forest. So Wildcarders need to look at Boomer because he's got a home fixture against uh, Brentford. And uh, Frank mentioned that uh, Thomas Frank mentioned that Tony isn't going to start, which makes Boomer just a better asset. He's going to be on pens as well. Fulham obviously have good fixtures. They've got Ipswich away, which is a nice one. But after that, West Ham and Newcastle at home. Aren't the best fixtures, which is if you're weighing up somebody like an ESR versus uh, Rogers, this needs to be a part of the equation. Chelsea have good fixtures, so Maduake is an option. And they don't have that many options on the right. Yes, Chelsea have a lot of options, but I think Maduake as a short-term pick is fairly safe. That said, he's not going to get so much space because Wolves had no left-back. But uh, other teams that Chelsea face will have left-backs. Uh, Jota, if you don't own him, is a definite option. He's playing United away, then Forest at home and Bournemouth at home. I feel like he might hold that position a little longer. Both Jota and Diaz are good picks, as we discussed on the pod. And uh, I just want to talk about Minty as a potential replacement. Arsenal away, then got to switch and Forest at home in 4 and 5. The problem is Adingra did well, and Minty wasn't his best against United. That's it. High upside option with uh, two good home games against Ipswich and Forest. But if you're doing that, you've got to wait until game week four and see what happens. Right, that's the transfer targets. Who did I go with? Aston Villa, right? We spoke about that and I went with Morgan Rogers. Let's talk a little bit about him. Uh, this is data from, for Rogers from last season. And uh, my worry is when I saw the game against Arsenal, he was great against Arsenal. He was the best player on the pitch. So what does that do? That solves the Doubt that I have him about expected minutes. I reckon he was the one of the best players on the pitch, which means that he should start the next two, three, four games. And he's 5 million. Also, but he did a lot of beating his player and he did a lot of ball progression. But I spoke to a couple of Villa fans and the problem with assessing Rogers, he's still raw when it comes to the end product, right? You want a goal or assist for FPL points and that quite wasn't there yet. That said, he squared a ball to Watkins who had an easy chance on goal and he just missed it. But this is what Rogers did last year. In the league, between gimmick 23 and 36, like he took a while to warm up. You can see a 15 minutes, 56 minutes, 61 minutes, 62 minutes. But once he was a part of the first team, he got 90, 68, 90, 90, 90, 22. Like that was good. Those minutes are good. And even in the first two games, he's not been subbed off. McGinn is the guy who's been subbed off. So that was encouraging. And once he got starting, look at those returns. He got, he got an assist in gimmick 31 against City. He got a goal against Brentford at home. Then he got no return against As Arsenal. Then he got a goal against uh, Bournemouth at home and he got a goal against Chelsea at home. So he did get attacking returns in that nice run that he had towards the end of the season. So this substantiates and tells me that by virtue of him being in the front three for Aston Villa, he should be in the goals and returns. It's 5 million. And look at Aston Villa's opponents, man. Uh, last year, they beat Everton at home 4-0 and they had an XG of 3. They conceded an XG of 0.63. Against Fulls, they had an XG of 0.98 but they scored 2 goals. Against United, they had an XG of 2.43. Against Fulham, they had an XG of 1.61. Against Bournemouth, they had an XG of 2.51 and scored 3 goals. So the, the opponents are obliging. The fixtures for Aston Villa in the near future are looking good. They did well against them last year. And uh, I mean, look at them. All the games except Wolves who are much poorer defensively this season, they had an XG of 1.5. So points you think should be coming. This is important for Rogers, for people looking at ESR replacements, uh, at Nkuku replacements, and this is important for wildcarders as well. Who should be punting on Aston Villa? I think one of the reasons we are wildcarding is the fixture swing for Villa, going early on Palmer, and if you're light on Liverpool, going heavy on Liverpool. I think these are the three main reasons to wildcard if you're wildcarding right now. All right, uh... Other 
dilemmas. Okay, I'll, I'll spoke about why I did go with. Okay, uh, long story short, I did go with Morgan Rogers as my replacement because I'll I'll take you through my team very quickly. If I did in Cuckoo down to Rogers, it meant that I have enough money in the bank to do Saka to Sala next week. Should I fancy it? If I got Smithro instead. I wouldn't be able to do a straight swap to Saka to Salah. That said, I still prefer Rogers because I think the fixtures are better for Rogers compared to Smithrow. And I have Muniz and Robinson already. So I didn't want to double up on that Fulham attack. I wanted to diversify a little. And I like that little money. And I'm not sure I'll be doing Saka to Salah. It's the likeliest transfer that I'll make next week. But it opens up Saka to Salah next week if I want to. It opens up Isak to Watkins if I want to do it. It opens up, uh, you know, some sort of Gordon to... Diaz, I just like the thought of having money in the bank and then figuring out what to do next week. Likely transfer is Dosaka to Salah. I, I won't lie about that. All right. Let's uh, talk about some other things as well. Uh, I want to talk about projected goal scorers. Now, captaincies is something that we didn't discuss on the pod this week, so I'm going to cover it here. Now, look at that. Haaland is projected to score 0.96 goals. He was the likeliest to score one plus goals. And a lot of people are selling Isak. But look at this. He's got 0.62 projection and he's the second highest goal projected over Watkins because Watkins is an away game to Palmer and he's got 46% likelihood to score one plus goal. So he's, his odds are better than uh, Watkins. And I do think when you're talking about matchups, right, I do think that this home game for Newcastle against opposition that tends to offer space and transition is better for Newcastle. They like to play such open-ended games. I wouldn't be surprised to see two or more goals from Newcastle even though they haven't shown... Hints of displaying that performance early on in the season. I, I wonder if Tonali starts. I think that would be a difference. I'm hoping that Barnes starts instead of Murphy. It's interesting in the midweek Carabao Cup tie, Gordon continued playing on the left and Barnes played on the right. So I wonder if uh, Eddie Howe was trialing that and something he persists with. That said, Gordon got his goal from the right-hand side, so you don't mind it. I'm happy to give them time, especially because the next game that they have after is Fulham away. That's one of the reasons where you're dicey about the Newcastle assets, but I didn't want to... Throw them out just yet. I don't want to wildcard them out. Uh, that's why I'm persisting with Newcastle for the next two games. I like the Spurs game. There's options for goal. There's this chances for goals for the attackers. I also think that this odds uh, weighs into the fact that Isak is definitely on pens. We don't know for sure if Watkins is on pens. We don't have that bit of information yet in terms of who's going to be on pens for Aston Villa. Salah uh, up there. Palmer up there. Havertz up there. Watkins up there. Saka up there. Who am I captaining this week? Holland at the moment because he's on pens in form. It's difficult to not captain a guy after a hat-trick. That said, I do think West Ham away won't be an easy fixture. Now, if that's not an easy fixture, I do have a slight temptation to captain Isak. It's a very slight temptation. The problem is Newcastle haven't shown any hints of form yet and Spurs have looked good. So do I take the risk? Do I roll the dice? I'm not quite sure. But I'm tempted. Saka against Brighton also... Out of my team is a decent captaincy option. I said, I just am not confident captaining a player like Breton. That's said, he's playing against Hinshelwood. Hinshelwood was terrible against United. I thought United could have and should have done much better against Brighton. I wasn't that impressed with Brighton. And I quite think that everybody waxing lyrical about Brighton this early on this season. Like, I don't think they, there's enough proof in the pudding to sh tell us that Brighton are the thing. Like, United, if they had slightly better, this final, better decision making in the final third... I think we could have beaten Brighton. And that says a lot because I don't think we are the best team. If you own Palmer and Watkins, who should you captain? I think Haaland is a good safe bet. Nothing wrong with captaining Haaland. On, odds on for 90 minutes, XG Hogger in that West Ham team. So yeah, I'm not going to not captain Haaland. I reckon it's too risky. And it's, it doesn't make sense. I mean, West Ham haven't looked the best either. Uh, so, But it's I think it's not going to be an easy game, West Ham for Haaland. Would you captain Salah, Palmer or Watkins? I, I think I'd be tempted to captain Watkins because Watkins is capable of exploding. He's capable of a two-return, three-return game. Similarly with Palmer, he's capable of exploding. So these two, as puns, I don't mind. There's a 5% chance I captain Isak because it's something that's at the back of my head because I see it as slightly open-ended game, but I don't think I do it. Haran is the best, safest captaincy option. Salah? You know what? I don't think he's a great captaincy option because A... Uh, slot isn't playing as rock and roll as he did as Klopp did there might be more control in that game and United 
might not be as poor defensively as we've been in the past. So I'm hoping it's a KG game and I won't be surprised to see like a 1-0 or a 2-1 sort of game. I don't expect it to be a very open-ended game, if I'm being perfectly honest. Right, uh, just talking through some of the matchups. Arsenal are right up there in terms of top goal score projections and have the best clean sheet odds as well. Now, nobody has really good, plus mentioned on this video, nobody really has good clean sheet odds. The highest is uh, Arsenal at 42%. So it just, if your defense looks bad from an FPL point of view, so does everybody else's. Even Arsenal aren't guaranteed a clean sheet against Brighton in my opinion. Brighton are perfectly capable of scoring one goal. Uh, but uh, I think there was so much space for him, uh, you know, United against Hinshelwood. I think Saka might exploit that. And I think Arsenal might score two plus goals in this game. Uh, Everton Bournemouth. Seven years a good one week punt for those looking to sell in Kuku. Just a one week punt because he's got tough fixtures after this. But he's top of the shots chart so far this season. Look really good for Bournemouth. Everton still have injury problems at the back. So yeah. Ashton Villa is just 1.9. You know, uh, Arsenal, City, even Spurs are just about, and Newcastle are just about the same. So, that said, you know, Aston Villa could easily click into gear. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see Ollie Watkins bursting. Like, he took a while to get going last year as well. But when he, once he got going, he's got like a two-return, three-return game in him. Like, the person who will be thinking about that miss the most will be Watkins, not anybody else. West Ham City, City are 2.45 to score. So Haaland is just a good captaincy option. When you know he's good for 90-95 minutes, he's on pens, uh, there's going to be no rotation, early subs, etc. Just a good safe option. Newcastle Spurs, they see, see this is 1.85, 1.85. So they see a high scoring game as well. Even Spurs are capable of scoring. Spurs have goals in them as well. So this is going to be an interesting game. I wouldn't be surprised to see like four goals or more in this game. I, I'm expecting that sort of basketballish game. Brentford against Southampton, man. If you don't have, if you have Bumo, if you don't have Bumo, and you're looking at a replacement, he's right up there as an option for me. Because yes, he's got a tough game against City in four. But in five also, he has Spurs, which is a good fixture for attacker. It's a good fixture for Bumo too. And uh, most wildcarders in gaming six will have Bumo in their team. So yeah, get Bumo. Uh, if you're wildcarding, get Bumo. Like he's like a glue guy. And with Ivan Tony going, he's just a really good pick. Chelsea versus Palace. Uh, is some a team that I'll cover as well. You'd expect Chelsea to win. You'd expect Chelsea to do well. And if Palmer continues to play as the 10, he is sensational as an FPL asset. Just a good player. That said, we need to see what happens with Chelsea in the market today. They're in for Sancho. They're in for Osman. They're in for uh, Tony if Osman doesn't work out. So lots going to happen today. Time stamping. I'm, I'm, I'm recording this video on Friday morning. So I haven't had the press conferences on Friday. I haven't had... Uh, uh, transfer news as well. So, you know, if things become slightly irrelevant, we'll, we'll discuss that. All right. Wildcard tips. I, as mentioned, I think you should also make a practice of considering the wildcard every week so that that focuses you on planning what fixtures are there right now or fixtures are there in the future. Uh, why am I waiting at the moment? Information. I feel like we don't have enough information at the moment. Uh, teams I haven't quite got, gotten quite into gear. Think about Southampton and our perception of them game week one. Even the first 30 minutes they played well against Newcastle. Then they go on to concede six big chances against uh, Forest. So, you know, can you make hot picks based on your hot takes this early on in the season? I'm not quite confident. And if you're wild cutting, then you have to play a little bit safe. I don't think you can go for like too many risky picks. Like information, I want to know if Rico is going to play a bigger part in Pep's plans this season. If he continues to use Walker in the Champions League. I want to know if there is going to be a 5.5 million defender available from Arsenal, I want to see how... <laughs> I want more substantial reasoning in terms of how teams are going to be looking this year. Uh, Europe is a factor. How are teams going to treat Europe? What kind of rotation can we expect? What kind of minutes can we expect? There's a Champions League tie, Graham, between 4 and 5, 6 and 7, 8 and 9. I like the wildcard 6 because it's at least we give us gets us one week of information between 4 and 5 in terms of how teams are looking at Champions League this season. A lot of the players have come into the camps late. Roddy's not even played a minute of preseason yet. So I feel like a lot of the teams are in preseason mode. So there's a lot of noise in terms of our perception of certain teams and how we are expecting them to do this season. So I'm quite not confident in picking a team. That said, you know, if you have problems like Nkuku, Solanke, Bako, Hall, all Konsa, all washed up together, then it makes perfect sense to wildcard this week or next. There's a good swing of fixtures. I just feel like, what are my tips if you're wildcarding right now? A, look at game week six onwards as the horizon and 
get two or three players that people are going to get then so that you're not very far behind have a deeper squad like for example i had solanke injured if i had rogers as my fifth attacker i might not have to hurry to move that transfer out and i could save two or three transfers and two or three transfers are more powerful than one transfer because you can change your structure around you can move from a premium forward to a cheap forward which allows you to an upgrade like a cheap defender to an expensive one and a mid mid to an expense like you can change the structure of your team when you're using transfers in clunks of two three four compared to just one free transfer so deeper squad helps not extinguish fires all the time also think about how you're planning to play i feel like this season there's so many good big hitters right that we might to might need to target fixture swings for these big hitters especially because you're getting like Salah's getting more bonus points than he ever did so you need to nail the captaincy and i feel like switching be between big hitters might be one of the ways to play it that means that you need like five or six glue guys in your team five or six glue who are the glue guys the picks like Bumo, picks like sa picks like trent picks like an arsenal defender like these are the glue guys in your team that you don't need to shift around that you don't need to worry about at all no matter what like you need to have certain secure glue guy picks so that it allows you to switch around the risky picks and the big hitters. I think those are the more movable positions in your team. I think that's how I might end up playing this season. TBD. It's it's all it's not as black and white as that as discussed on the pod, right? So it's going to be based on how things pan out during the season. And limit risks of your wild carding right now. Because remember, you're picking your team for 15 plus game weeks right now. Uh so need to have a fairly secure, safe base like if you are having Rico Lewis in your team make sure he's the only pick in your team that has an exponent out. you know, don't fill your team up with exponent outs then you're going to be extinguishing fires very soon and you're not going to be able to make luxury transfers so that's my tip to wildcarders at the moment let's talk about my team for game week 3 I love that I have not changed the animation uh, alright couple of decisions that I had as you can see, I've got a nice yellow kit as my keeper uh, because Vladmerson did keep a clean sheet for Brentford. I'm expecting Flecken to be first choice, but Henderson doesn't have the best fixture. And just in case, you know, uh, Thomas Frank sees that Flecken isn't that great uh, and gives the game to Vlad, who got a clean sheet. It's just like a 5 or 10% chance that I'm taking. Uh, otherwise, Henderson comes in for Vlad. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't mind Henderson that much because these sort of middling keepers tend to get the biggest hauls against tough games so if palace fluke a clean sheet you wouldn't be surprised to see henderson make five or six saves that's it he's terrible he's not been good but you won't be surprised to see henderson make five or six saves and get some bonus points so that's there that was my decision another decision that i had was who do i start munoz or fulham munoz who plays chelsea away or johnson who plays fulham at home i have decided to pick munoz over johnson and this could change today if McKenna says something in the press conference because I spoke to my friend Ivan, FPL Rouser, who's an Ipswich fan. And I genuinely think Ipswich now shift to a 4-5-1, which is essentially a, a 3 at the back and then Leaf Davis bombs forward. So the other centre-back, other wing-back on the other side almost acts like a consa style centre-back. And he says that... Uh, Duanzebi is likelier to play this position compared to Johnson. So it's a 50-50 call. So it's expected minutes aren't sure. And even then, Johnson was poor in midweek. That's what he said. So that's why I think I might start Munoz ahead of Johnson at the moment. And Munoz is, I'm not expecting a clean sheet. But you wouldn't be surprised to see a goal. That's all. Taking that chance with my boy. Otherwise, Trent and Robinson are there. Rogers comes in. Uh, I'm going to start him. I've got Saka, Gordon, Jota. At the moment, my captain is Haaland. As I mentioned, Isak and Muniz. Going to be patient with all these guys. At the moment, my captain is Haaland. But there's a 5% chance with Isak. I don't think it's going to happen, if I'm perfectly honest. So 95% my captain is Haaland. There's a 5% chance it's Isak. I don't think I'm going to do it. That's my moves for this week. And likely going to be doing Saka to Salah next week. That said, if Spurs concede 3 to Newcastle, you're, you're reconsidering that. I was tempted to vice captain Saka also because he's got a good fixture. Brighton, you know, he should do well against Hitchelwood. And Bright I think Arsenal scored two plus goals. That said, Haaland just feels safe and secure in form. Hasn't done anything wrong. He looks for a go couple of goals. Looks good for a couple of goals every game. Uh, that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was useful. If you're wildcarding, good luck. Curb your risks. Imagine I'm saying that. And uh, good luck, man. We'll see you next week. And uh, take care. Bye-bye.